I was always told to sit on the front porch while she entertained. The gentleman exited the house, car pulled up, guy got out of the car, bone fragments and blood all over me. Maybe that's what started this whole mess, I don't know. Broken home, broken dreams. Gave my mind to these millions and my heart to the guy. Probably die up in these streets, but I survived through my name. Welcome back to the Broken Home Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight's guest, he is a musician, a producer, a writer, an entrepreneur, and a criminal consultant. He is Sean Scott Hicks. How you doing tonight, Sean? Doing pretty good, guys. Thank you for having me on, man. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. How we usually do it around here is we like to take it right back to the very beginning. Where did you come from and where did you grow up? Um, I grew up um, South Boston, Dorchester, uh, Quincy, Somerville, just Boston, general Boston. Did you come from a big family? I came from a big family. I was kind of the black sheep of the family. Um, everybody else in my family is uh, pretty much... Um, well, aside from my uncle, everyone else is a professional. So we're going to get into your uncle as well. But growing up, what was the home situation like? We're called Broken Home Podcast because a lot of us, we came from broken homes that we changed our whole lives around. And it's sort of like a theme that we got. What was your household like? My mom, um, unfortunately, um, God rest her soul, uh, got addicted to drugs. Um uh, prostitution. She was a gun mall, for lack of better words. It wasn't, uh, there was no support there until I went to prison and got my GED and two college degrees through uh, prison programs. Um, I only had a fourth grade education formally. And your father, was your father around at all? I, my mom got knocked up by uh, my uncle, Howie Winter's brother, who wasn't involved in organized crime. He came from a very prim and proper background. He was a uh, former military and, and decorated in the war, Korean War and such. So uh, I was the, uh, the bastard kept in the closet. I was given to a gentleman that I called him. I, I, well, I call him my father. He's Bob's. He raised me. He was Jewish, um, dabbled in being a bookie and such. And uh, he raised me. Um, and uh, he, he did the best he could. My mom, I, I just, uh, I was actually in um, Concord State Prison. I think I was playing a game of whist or something. And uh, about six uh, correctional officers walked in with the priest, the Catholic priest. And they said, Sean, can we talk to you? I said, are you taking me to the hole right now? Because there's a lot of you. And they said, no, Father Thomas would like to talk to you. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of right in the middle of a game of whist right now. And I got about 500 bucks riding on this. What's up? So uh, he, he bent over and he whispered into my ear. He said, Sean, unfortunately, your mother has just passed away. I said, okay, thank you. Now let me get back to my game of whist. Basically, that's what she meant to me at the end. Was there ever a, a, a relationship or a bond between you and your mom? No. Um, she, we're... Where Henry Simons raised me, she would use me as a pawn. She would take me around the country, um, shacking up with this mobster, that mobster, um, whoever, whoever the flavor of the month was. There was an emotional uh, connection with Henry who loved me dearly. And she would have money wired to her and say, wire me this and I'll send him back to you. So it was a back and forth. Like a yep. bargaining chip. Yeah, extortion with a handshake. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She was, uh, she was an interesting lady. Let's say that. When you think back to the relationship that you had with her, was there ever any good times? No, I actually, uh, I mean, everybody tells me I have a beautiful smile, but I had to have everything reconstructed because she hit me with a can of Campbell's soup. She rifled it at me like, and it broke everything. Everything had to be reconstructed. Was she young when she had you? No, she was, um, oh, Christ. In her 40s? Oh, really? Because a, yeah. a, lot, a lot of women, they, when they have kids young, they're emotionally immature, and they don't know how to be a, a mother. And that's what it sounded like that it was coming from. But no, there was no, 
There was no um, reason for her to act like that. No, I think my mother had a total of 13 children. Oh. Yeah. Um, and only six of us she kept. Okay. Are you in contact with any of the other ones? My younger brother, who's two years younger than me, he just turned 50. He and I speak three or four times a week. Oh, yeah. I, he's never been involved in uh, any type of organized crime. He's a, he's a nine to fiver. Um, he's got a, a very successful seafood trucking company. And, That's awesome uh, for him. That's good. It's amazing uh, what he's done. So I admire that. I tell him all the time. I'm like, you're the gangster, not me, brother. Because that I'll be damned if I could do what you do, driving, you know, every day and tractor trailers and managing um, other trucks and, and, and it just I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's for damn sure. A lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, no easy uh, money there. No, no. <laughs> I recently seen an interview with you on uh, James English. Amazing interview. Amazing interview. That's how I, I came across your story. You said that you witnessed your first murder at five years old. What happened there um, and how did that impact you going down the road? I, I think, well, how it impacted me. I was five. I mean, I wasn't naive because my mom would entertain um, her, her, drugs, her drug dealers. I was always told to sit on the front porch while she entertained her company. The gentleman exited the house, car pulled up, guy got out of the car, shot him in the face. There was, you know, the brains and uh, bone fragments and blood all over me. Maybe that's what started this whole mess. I don't know. Yeah, quite possibly. Does that memory haunt you to this day i have to be careful what i say because uh yeah i'll be quite frank with you it fucked me up it fucked me up but it also uh i saw the uh the ugliness and the insidious side of humanity and unfortunately and i can't blame anybody i take all the blame man because literally no one ever held a gun to my head and made me do the things I did but at, at that moment I think is when the seed was planted for the minimal value of human life speaking of which you were actually trained to become in your own words a John Wick type uh, how did that how did that happen and how old were you when you started getting involved in that it started with me being around um Everybody, when you're Irish, is an uncle. There was Uncle Howie, there was Uncle Whitey, there was Uncle Stevie, there was Uncle Toby. Everybody's uncle, Irish uncles. So around 10, I think, is when um, between 8 and 10, when my, my, my uh, pop finally got me back from my mother permanently. It was almost like a Bronx tale. If, if that makes any sense to you. Yep. Like an Irish version of the Bronx tale. It's, hey, go grab those cigarettes or hey, can you go, go go grab another bottle of liquor for us while they're all sitting around playing cards and such and just, you know, hanging out. And um, I guess it started then. And from that point at about 15, I was sent north. It was a serious training, learning how to, Conduct yourself and in, 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 uh, take out the trash. At the time, did you realize what you were getting into being so young? No, because um, coming from um, the situation with my mom, I craved, I craved the attention I was getting from these people. I it was, was the like, first oh. time. Yeah, first, first time. time I'm like, yeah. someone loves me, man. Someone loves me. Wow, this is awesome. You want me to learn how to shoot that gun? Oh, that's how I read a dope card? Oh, that's how I break that down? Oh, that's how I use a knife? Okay. And then it, I just thought I was being loved. Like the training start in the name of kind of like, I'm going to teach you how to defend yourself or we're going to teach you how to, you know, do some bad shit. No, it was straightforward. This is what you're going to do. This is what you need to learn how to do. You need to learn 
how to fight. You need to learn how to use a knife. Like a lot of people don't understand, you know, okay, well, I've got a rifle. Let me go shoot a deer. It doesn't work that way. You got to take into account curvatures and barometric pressure and wind and every other thing needs to be calculated in. It, it's, it's a lot. I mean, me personally, I was a more intimate guy. Um, you told me to do something. Um, I was the perfect little ball of clay and the potters made me the monster I became. Are, are you learning things like uh, human anatomy? Are you going like, how deep is it really going, the training? Yes. Everything you see on TV in Hollywood is just a bunch of bullshit. It literally is. If you want to take someone out, it's really just one precise stab and it's done. There's nothing medically that can be done to stop it. And at the same time, are you learning how to like save a life too? No, um, I think uh, I I won't say the gentleman's name. We were doing something and he got shot, and it was just common sense to me. He's bleeding. He's bleeding out like a stuck pig. I need to stick my fingers in there. Let me yeah. plug. The hole. Did you know who the Winter Hill Gang was when you were hanging out with your uncle? Like, did you hear on the news about it or? Oh, in in uh, in New England, it was always in the newspapers until they came and got me at a, and told my dad. And they're like, "It's time! It's time! It's time for him to know who he really is." My dad was a great guy. My pop, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, "Please don't do this." And they said, "He's coming with us." That's it. Was it against your will at the time too, or were you excited to be? doing this with your uncles? It was alluring to me. Because I'm like, wow, they're patting me on the back. They're messing my hair up. They're rubbing my head. They're telling me, good job, Shano. Good kid. We got you. Okay? You got me. Yeah, you got me, all right? You got me. You got me shot fucking four times, stabbed six times, and almost 25 years in fucking prison. You got me, all right? Good job, Shano. And that's time that you can never get back. But what you're doing um, now, what you're doing now, though, is it's like a, the redemption. You're doing so much positive now. I am. And I was just having a conversation with um, a, a very good friend of mine that just uh, left here, who's a straight citizen, IT guy. He's uh, he called me this morning. And he was like, you're fucking tortured, aren't you? I said, yeah. 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 I get morally conflicted a lot because I'm trying. I my, my daughter's running around here somewhere with well, my granddaughter, one of them, and my grandchildren. And she was in diapers when I started going to prison. So I robbed her of having a father. And her mother was, uh, for lack of better words, no good. And uh, her and her sister ended up uh, being placed in the, uh, the system. Um, she went to, and, uh, and I didn't know this. I didn't know this until we were filming a uh, reality show that's in post-production right now. I didn't know she hit 26 foster homes. I didn't know she was sexually abused. I didn't know anything. I was in prison, you know? She's a renegade. She's my... She's my, she's my little, like, mini-me. And then I get mad. I get frustrated. And I'm like, this is your fault. You, got, you have to take the responsibility for this. You did this to her. Because I don't care who you are, what your religion is, what your skin color is, no one can say that they asked to be born. Somebody made that choice. Somebody made that choice. And I'm just like, okay. She gets me mad. I mean, she almost burnt my last house down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, all right, I'm on tour. What the hell were you doing? She's like, uh -huh. I was trying to make French fries and I put the oil in a pan and um, I fell asleep. <laughs> and the house was all right, though? Oh no! It almost burned to the ground. Oh shit! Yeah, man. That's why we got we just we actually we had to move to a newer house, and I'm just like, 
all right. And my, you know, my 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 wife, her stepmother's like, she's just like you. I'm like, yeah, I know. Apple doesn't fall, you know, fall far from the tree. I just, I try now to instill values and morals. Um, she gets mad at me. We get into arguments every day. We got into a huge argument last night because um, my wife's daughter, my stepdaughter, is a wonderful, wonderful young woman. She uh, graduated top honors. Um, she went right into college. And um, there's a, a, a this little back and forth between them because I, you know, I'll give Mackenzie whatever she wants. I'll give her whatever she wants because she's a good kid. You know what I mean? And but my daughter will get mad at me. She'll can I have a dollar? No. Absolutely not. Pay my phone bill. No. Make it on your own. Make it on your own. I said, because I don't want you to feel entitled. And, you know, she's, uh, we just actually, uh, I don't know if you guys can see around here, but we just bought a, uh, a mansion, the biggest house in town. Nice. Oh, nice. She's, she's like, oh my God, it's just you and Charlene. And I'm like, yup. She's like, let me move in. You have a guest house. You have everything. I said, nope. Pay me rent. How's that? Earn it like I did. I, I want to instill that value. That's right. I want that value that I, I, we, uh, my wife and I have um, a, a foster son. And, every, and That's the funniest thing. I don't know if you guys watch my social media. Um, Rashid, he's from Jamaica. Came from a broken home. And he literally had tears in his eyes a few years a few years, a few years now Jesus Christ he said I don't want to be another statistic I don't want to be another young black man that gets killed gang banging I'm not a thug I don't want to sell drugs he lives here he, he's, he's lived with us for years and years man and I produce his music for him and I put it out when 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 Mob Rock is ready to put it out and he was just actually in Atlantic City with us, and he's like, "Your pop, why are you so hard on me?" I said, "Because I love you." That's right. Mm -hmm. I said, "I put a roof over your head, right?" But I told him, "Do not count on music. Do not count on acting. Don't count on any of that." And so he works two forty-hour jobs a week. He goes. Overnight as a security guard. Then he goes and catches an hour nap in his car. And then goes into his daytime job uh, at a dispensary. And I said, I'm, I'm, I want you to learn that life is not given to you. Nothing is given to you. That's right. Yeah. It's my, well, my, now my daughter, Asia, she's got to the point when everybody's like, oh my God, your dad's rich. Or you're rich, you're rich. And she's like, I'm, I'm not rich. Shit, I'm trying to figure out how to pay my phone bill. My dad just told me to, you know, go pound fucking sand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's going to pay As off and she's going to thank you in the end. That's right. That's right. I hope so. I hope so. I yeah. really do. Because I have to do the same thing with my kids too. It's, 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 nothing's a handout. There's got to be something. You got to do something for that. You have those to couple do bucks. It, it's quid pro quo. Yeah. No one ever gave me anything. Okay. No one ever gave me anything. The only thing I really got for free was 25 years in prison, 24 years and nine months in prison. I got that for free. How old were you the first time you got sent away? Um, I think 17 is a youthful offender. It wasn't long. It's was just a short stint. And then I came home and then for the rest of my life, um, up until the last time I got out, what, three and a half years ago now, almost four years ago, I had never, I had never been free for any more than three months, four months. And that's like, that's why um, uh, we got to 
a docuseries coming out and, and the pitch deck and everything. And I just said, here, here's my 37 page fucking record. Just put that on the pitch deck. Let it talk for itself. Cause yeah, it just, it speaks for itself. And there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing omitted. There's nothing blacked out. It's, it's all there. Here you go. This is my, I guess now that I'm doing this entertainment crap, here's my fucking resume. What the fuck? Did you ever think when you were sitting behind those bars that this would be your life now? No, um, that's one of, and that's one of the things that tortures me is uh, I knew a lot of good guys, a lot of great guys, and I know a lot of bad guys. Uh, my my shrink tells me you have survivor's guilt. I question it. I'm like, why the fuck am I here? What the fuck did I do to deserve it? I, I don't deserve to be here. I, I, I don't. I just shot in the fucking head. I should have been dead. I woke up with my buddy's finger in my skull going, fucking son of a bitch. He just cracked his fucking skull, but he's okay. Sticking his fucking finger in the hole. Wow. What Man. happened there? Are you able to talk about that scenario? Yeah, I was coming out of a meeting in a... Uh, an individual, I won't say his name. Thank God he watched too many fucking Hollywood movies and he held the gun sideways. And he just walked up and shot me. And, um, and I woke up uh, in the back seat of an SUV with uh, an acquaintance of mine had his fingers in, in, in the hole with the, uh, the inside my flesh. And they were all laughing. And they said, son of a bitch, he didn't even... He's good. He'll be all right. He's going to have a headache, though. <laughs> yeah, well, one hell of a headache. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was nuts. It was pretty crazy. Was and headache, did, did you ever find you found out who is the shooter? That's exactly what one reporter asked me, Sean. Who shot you? I said, motherfucker with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> what was your final stay in prison for? What were your charges that were allegedly brought against you? I had a. Uh, business arrangement with the um a gentleman that had a bar that i i used as my um quasi office i was uh sitting there one day and um a police officer walked in but he was a, he was a customer a regular he said sean i would never believe that you would allow someone such as this around your family and i was like what the fuck are you talking about dude who, what, 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 where, where are we going with this? And he described the individual, he described one of my uh, company trucks that he drove. And I just blurted the, the guy's name out as I knew him. And he just looked at me, he goes, that's not his fucking name. I said, where are we going with this, man? And he said, uh, about seven or 10 years, something like that. Prior, he had raped his niece and the family didn't want to put her through the trial so they sent her uh, to live with an aunt but he had done it in such a manner that um, they had to remove her uterus and then uh, I, I sat there and I thought about it and I, I called it. another bar that we use a couple of my guys were there and I was I said where's, where's such and such right now he said he's sitting at the end of the bar drinking I said Keep him there. Have shots with him. Drink beers with him. Don't tell him I'm coming. Just make sure he does not leave. I went there and uh, sat down next to him. And he said, hey, what's up, boss? I said, hey, how are you doing? And I told the bartender. I said, Why don't you give me that fifth over there. He put it down in front of me. And I, I turned to the guy, and, and you know, he and at this point had draped his uh, he draped his arm over my shoulder, and he was like, "Hey, what do we got going on tomorrow?" And broke the bottle over his head. I said, "You're gonna die. That's what's gonna happen. You're not gonna be here tomorrow." I tried to kill him for what he did. He destroyed that little girl's life, physically and mentally. And at that moment. I was in such a rage, I didn't care. I just didn't give I didn't, I didn't give two fucks. I just wanted him to die at that moment. And um, thank God my bartender 
he came out from behind the bar because I, I, I reached over and, you know, I went behind the bar, I think, if I remember correctly. Anyways, I, I grabbed the butcher knife that uh, he used to cut uh, lemons and limes and such. And I said, I'm cutting his fucking head off. But the bartender came out and he pulled a pistol out. And he said, Sean, I love you to death, brother. I love you to death. But I'm going to shoot you in the arm. I'm going to shoot you in the fucking leg. I cannot let you do this in front of 30 fucking customers. He saved your life that day. Actually, you know something? As funny as it sounds, the judge who sentenced me, well, well he's going to be part of the docuseries that's coming out with Greg Donis. He saved my life. Oh, really? He gave me, he gave me the maximum sentence they were looking for, which would have been, I don't know, 15 years of life or some shit like that. And then he said, and now I'm going to commute it immediately. But you're going to get your anger in check. You're going to go and complete a program and, and get your shit together. He goes, because you have the ability to do things way beyond what police officers, district attorneys, judges, and everybody has to do. He goes, tomorrow's leaders will listen to you because they respect you. That's you right. Have, you have an influence on, on, on today's adolescents. And he said, I will not squander that commodity because mankind's greatest stock is our children. That's our future. And he said, and they listen to you. They look up to you. But you need to do it for the right reasons. So that's kind of where I, it, that was like that fucking, oh, fuck. That was an aha moment. It was like, fuck. I was like, son of a bitch, dude. All right. I see where you're going with it. Did you have any thought about speaking to the youth about staying on the right path before this, before this judge said that to you? I, I did it a couple times, but it was court ordered. It was court ordered. They told me to come in. Uh, it was called, it's called the straight ahead program, um, which is not as drastic as the uh, scared straight. I don't think that works. I do not think that works. Uh, it was Judge uh, Geraldine Coffey put the, the uh, program together. And I got in a little bit of trouble. And she told my lawyer, have him come in once a month and speak to all the kids we assemble in the courtroom, the at-risk youth, because they don't want to hear from me. They don't want to hear from the cops. They don't want to hear from the DAs. They'll listen to him. Yeah. But it wasn't, you know, I'm not going in there screaming in their face and all that crap. I'm just telling them, man, here, this is, here's the reality of it. This is what it's really like. This is what it's like, man, to sit in a cell, six by nine, have all of your liberties stripped away from you. Um, there's nothing, well, for me, there was nothing ever gratifying about ever hurting a human being. It's just, just something I had to do. And I, I, I created my own coping mechanisms. It's just a switch. I just turn the switch off. That's all. I turn off the switch. And that led to my alcoholism. I don't know, probably about 50 fucking broken fucking medicine cabinet mirrors. Because I, I, I used to hate the person looking back at me. I hated him. He disgusted me. And is that from all the remorse from the years beforehand, things that you've had to do? Um, yes. It's from the darkness, the chaos that uh, I imparted upon this world. Yeah, definitely. I'm trying to ask different questions because I want people to watch the James English episode because it was fantastic. You, you put it all out on the table there. So I'm just trying to stay away from everything that was said on there because you laid it out in chronological order it was a perfect interview so okay. i want this yeah i want this to sort of be like something different for for the listeners to be hearing so so if i'm not asking like the, the you're same driving kind of the car, brother. you're driving it's, right it's your car. you're driving i'm in the passenger seat 
<laughs> right on. <laughs> right on. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> yeah. I, I was actually wondering how many times you were able to speak to troubled youth and what kind of impact you saw on their faces as you're you're talking to them. I, I, I can't remember the amount of times I did because they used, they used to parade them into the prisons too. I just didn't, uh, I didn't like doing it the way other guys did, you know, getting in their face, screaming and all that crap. It ain't going to work because if you did that to me, I'd just be like, go fuck yourself. That's right. <laughs> go fuck yourself. What do you, you, you're not, you can scream at me. You're not going to put your fucking hands on me. So I tried to, um, when I talk to, when I talk to uh, youth, I try to let them know it's not what you think it is. It's not. It's there's a, a, a different way to live life. And if you have the opportunity to not go down the wrong path, take it. Get an education. There's nothing cool about doing the things I did and the people that um, I was associated with did. If I could go back, if I could turn that fucking clock back, man, I might have been a politician. I might have been a lawyer. I might have been something. I don't know. And That's right. I don't want to see someone. I, I, I think that what a lot of people don't realize we're here for a fucking minute. That's it. In, in, in the overall the overall scheme of stuff, I don't care if you live to 50 or 60, 70, 80. I don't care if you live to 150. It's still a blink of an eye in the overall scheme. So what are you doing? What are you doing with that time? What are you leaving? <sighs> My... And daughter's running around here now. And I'm like, I don't want someone coming up to her in 20 or 30 years when I'm dead and gone and saying, wow, your grandfather was an animal. What a monster. To me, where I'm at presently, it's how do I change my legacy for my family and the ones I leave behind? How do I do that? How do I set an example to teach values and morals and respect and love? How do I do that? And I, 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 I try daily because my path back, my path to humanity is very treacherous. Is I catch my time. I, you know, I catch myself sometimes. I catch myself. I'm just like, fuck, 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 fuck. pump the brakes, pump the fucking brakes, dude. Pump the brakes. Like literally, we're in freaking Atlantic City, Caesar's Palace. Headline of the show. I mean, my, my whole label's there from around the country. All of my artists. And someone did something that rubbed me wrong. And I'm like, come outside for a minute. And I had the flashes in my head. I said, I just want to fucking kick his fucking skull in right now and throw him off the fucking pier because you just disrespected me. Other people around me, you know, they were like, Sean, 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 there's cops here, there's cops everywhere, there's cameras everywhere, you can't do it. And I thought about it, and I said, okay, you know something? You're right. You're right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to walk out. I'm not going to be unprofessional because I have 14 people here from around the country that believe in me and trust me that are my, my recording artists. I'm not going to just walk away from this. We're going to do the show. I'm going to get up on stage. I'm going to play the puppet. But the individual that rubbed me wrong, I said, you need to stay away from me for the rest of the night. Don't come in the green room. Don't talk to me. But you made my wife cry. And I do, I do business with the guy. I mean, literally, he's, he's, he's I'm not going to say his name because I'm not that guy. He distributes all of our music. But I said, you made my wife cry. But cooler heads prevailed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cooler heads because um, it was almost instinctual to be that old person, to be that monster, to be that animal that they created. And How I told hard them, is it? Oh, man, dude. 
trying to separate the two from old Sean to family, business, entrepreneur Sean. How hard is that to separate? It's very hard. I have to be honest. It's 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 I, I have to work at it. Yep. And the only reason that I did not react the way I wanted to react is I told him, I said, your 14 year old daughter's in sitting right there staring at us, waving, waving at us through the door. I won't do that in front of her. I won't, I don't, I won't do what I want to do in front of her. And, you know, there was a lot of people involved, a lot of moving parts. Um, finally, um, some of his partners reached out and I had just said, I need some time to cool off guys. So I, I gave it a week. I gave it a week. He reached out to me yesterday and he said, Hey man, I, I didn't realize how serious it was. I said, you're going to apologize to my wife before this conversation continues. I said, you are going, you made her cry. And for that, I'm just, I'm, She's innocent. She's never done anything to you. But you're going to apologize to her first and foremost. That's it. But I'm, it could have been worse, but it worked out. Yeah. No, no, that's good. That's good that, that you were able to catch yourself before making a life-altering decision. Because that's all it takes is a split second and things are back the way they were and you're back behind the bars. It's something that yeah. you must have to think about every single day. It is. I mean, it's, it's funny, right? I see you have tattoos. What do you got on your hand? It looks pretty good. I got a couple different things up on there. Nice. I like that. I walk around, right? Murder. Mayhem. Hate 100%. Pain 24-7. No peace, love, no love, no mercy with death heads, skulls. Every one of my tattoos represents something. It's a time, a part of my life. But sometimes I think my soul's tattooed, scarred. I know what you mean by that. No, I know what you mean by that. This is my daughter, Asia. Why are they the same? Hi, Asia. Hey. I'm Jason. Oh. This is Mark. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Nice oh, to meet you. <laughs> Me too. This is the Broken Home Podcast. Um, they were asking me. I guess there's no, there's no more of a broken home than what I created. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when your father was gone, how did that affect you? Do you think? Did you look for as as hard as it might be to even admit this? Did you look for a father figure in anybody else? Probably some of my boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I had adopted parents, but I never really saw my adopted dad as my dad. He never was really there. Now you two are We're like bonded up. That is yeah. beautiful. That's beautiful. Your best friend. <laughs> you stuck yeah. with me now. You can't go away. I'm not That's right. You. I'm not paying your phone bill this month. Don't butter me up. That's what nice it That's the best one my last house down. <laughs> There's not going to be a deep fryer in that house or what? <laughs> no, she's not allowed to touch any 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 of the kitchen appliances. She's not allowed. To <laughs> it's easy for you to ask me what I think I did to her. I'd rather have her tell you herself. Yeah. What I what I did to her. It's from the fucking horse's mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ever really? uh, always like worried that maybe there's going to be a time in the future where you're not able to hold yourself back? Which is, it's like muscle memory. So I just did, I think it was the insider that hasn't come out yet. And they asked me, do you think you'll ever hurt somebody again? Well, now I don't wake up in the morning and know I have to go hurt somebody. I said, but I have to be real with you. And I, I just have to say, I don't know. If you hurt my family, if you hurt someone I love that are, that are, that are, close to my heart I'll cut your head off so I just don't know because I don't have a crystal ball is anybody ever gonna is my, my daughter gonna get a boyfriend that smacks her I don't know is someone going to disrespect my wife I don't know so I can't honestly I can't in, in good faith say oh no I'm changed look at me 
I'm, I'm, I'm the golden boy. No, fuck, I got to keep it real. So I just don't know. But I don't yes. get up. I don't get up in the morning and plan on saying fucking Joey bag of donuts or fucking Mikey fucking meatballs owes me fucking money and he hasn't paid me. So let me go break his fucking legs with a bat. I do wake up every day, drop to my knees. I ask God to give me the strength to not hurt somebody today. That's that's how I start my day. Creating darkness and pain and chaos and agony is easy. I did it to my own fucking family, my own flesh and blood. It was done to me. I did it to them. So where do we start? How do we break the fucking cycle? Where do you break that chain? That's that's where my days are every day. How do I break the cycle? It was done to me. In turn, I did it to mine. And I'm fortunate enough to have another generation of my family where I don't I don't want it to be done to my grandchildren. So it's just I, that that is my my main focus. I got a call. I got out of prison. First thing I do is always get a dog. Immediately. I got a call from somebody and they were like, this is a psychotic, deaf American bulldog, but they're going to put him down because he has, he's got um, a bite history. They can't place him. He was an employee of a shelter. And I said, okay, when are you going to euthanize him? They said, tomorrow morning. And I said, okay. So I went in that day. And um, they told me, no, he's, he's slated for uh, euthanization. Can I at least see him? They didn't tell me he was deaf. <laughs> so I just fucking normal dog. I just patted his side. You know what I'm saying? I just gave him a pat. That ended up in 17 stitches. Because I didn't Damn. know he was deaf. Yeah. I touched him without making eye contact with him. So they said, that's why we're going to put him down. And I said, no, let me work with him. Let me just work with him. And they said, ah, well, and I'm like, I just got an email from you guys that you're looking for a fundraising. You just sent me an email. So I'll give you $25,000 right now. Let me work with him. And I would sit outside with him every day for months, an hour, two hours, gaining his trust. Until they finally allowed uh, my wife and I to foster him. And I had to get, uh, I think it was a $100,000 liability insurance policy or something before they let us take him. And then I think it was after a year they let us adopt him. Because I saw him, in him, I saw myself. He was mistreated. He was abused. It's not his fault. So you might as well kill me then. How's that? I'm no different than him. I, I bite too. I'm no different than that, that animal. And um, it's worked out great. We've had him here. So. That's amazing. Nice. He got a second chance and so did you. I, that's what I, I, I wanted to give him was a chance. But I, it, was, it was having to understand his thought process of being beat, of being starved of food to make him aggressive. I had, to, I had to figure all that out. Was he a fighting dog before then? Well, he was, he, he was. Yeah. 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 So I had to, uh, I had to just I had to fucking just dig into it and say, how the fuck can I save this fucking thing? It's not his fault. And, and again, it's, he doesn't leave my side. He's fucking deaf as a fucking doorknob. His sight's going, but he does not leave my side. I mean, I'm sitting here. He, wherever I go, he's there, okay? It's unconditional love. Unconditional love. Because an animal doesn't know how to... You, you condition them. Yeah. But once you show them unconditional love, you will get it back tenfold. Yeah. And especially when uh, I like how you put it, uh, that you're on your path to humanity, back to humanity. 
I bet uh, having a dog really is an integral part of that path. Oh, absolutely. 100%. It's funny. Um, he, he, bite, he still bites. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but I tell people, rule of the house. He'll come up. He'll rub against your legs. He'll wag his fucking tail. Don't touch him. Do not try to pet him. Don't. Because he's doing the same thing I'm doing. He's trying to learn how to be normal. A dear friend of mine that's upstairs right now. Um, I don't know if you guys are watch, watch my social media. Um, Rudy Youngblood, the star of Apocalypto, is upstairs right now. Oh, we really? <laughs> and yeah, we decided we're going to... We actually, well, my, my writing partner, Andrew Jones, was here last night, and uh, we wrote the screenplay for Apocalypto 2. Oh, wow. wow. That is yeah. wild. That's amazing. And he's, 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 he's been here. Uh, he was in Atlantic City with me, and he was like, hey, man, I just want to hang out with you for a few weeks because you understand what goes on as a creative person. And people don't, people in the world do not understand us. Because he, he works with horses that have been abused. So he flew out from Austin um, I don't know, almost two weeks ago. And he was like, hey, do you want me to fly home? Or can I hang out for a few more weeks? And I'm like, bro, this fucking house is so big. I don't care. I don't even know how to fucking turn the goddamn lights on in some of the rooms. I don't want to do the stats. I don't know. Really I'm like, whatever you want to do, man. But we probably had one too many cocktails. Um, yeah, oh, I did. I did. And um, we decided to uh, just write a screenplay real quick. Oh wow! <laughs> Speaking about uh, movies, I'm assuming that you've seen Black Mass for about oh, Whitey Bulger. Oh, so is any, any none of that movie is no, true? Nothing. No. Other no. than the fact that that uh, for the sake of uh, entertainment, I will refer to him as Whitey. Jim was a psychopath. Plain and simple. Yeah. No one. He was very manipulative, very Machiavellian. And no one knew it. And other than that, he was a fucking rat. Yeah. And he got what he deserved. You're also writing a book, or you wrote a book, sorry. And when is that slated to be released? The Devil to Pay a Mobster's Road to Perdition comes out on Blackstone Publishing, March 26th, 2024. We just got, they're doing the whole, I don't know, they, they sent out the advanced reader copies, the ARCs. Um, I gave them all away because everybody was like, Sean, please, can we, can you sign this and blah, 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 blah. Um, I just got uh, two reviews back, one from Tom, uh, Tom Lang, the uh, co-lead detective on the O.J. Simpson case. Great review. Um, and also from former head of the FBI. Wow. Also a criminal consultant. Rod, Rod, at, at Rod, that's his name, Rod. I apologize. He uh, just wrote a review for us. I have um, um, Arthur Brand. Um, he's writing a review. He just messaged me. Um, he's the world's, actually he's called the Indiana Jones of uh, recovering stolen artwork. He's recovered more, more artwork, stolen artwork, than all of law enforcement in the world combined, FBI, um, Scotland Yard, Interpol, Europol. He's also the author of, uh, I think he's got two books out now. Um, Hitler's Horses was his last one. And um, he's giving me a review. So, yeah. What's your writing process like? Like, do you just talk it out with a writing partner and then, or, or are you just sitting there looking at a blank piece of paper? I, I have a writing partner, Andrew Jones, and... I don't type. Everything I do is longhand. He actually moved into my house for almost a year. <laughs> and I'm just like, I pace back and forth. Yeah. I, I talk, you type. I talk, you type. I talk, you type. Yeah, man. Oh, that works. That works. Motion creates emotion. Just walking <laughs> around. It, it does. It's the same way um, when I'm in the studio recording music. And are you still actively recording? We just got uh, Mig, who's Taylor Swift's producer, Leanne Rhymes' producer. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Man. Mob Rock Don't Stop. 
to take over. No, that's for damn sure. How did Mob Rock begin? Sure. I got out of prison and said, you know something? I love I love creating music. I think I want to be a rock star. Man. And it just went from there. It just went from there, man. Such a yeah. bold thought to be walking out of prison. Yep. All right, now, yep. now it's time to be a rock star. <laughs> I said, what, am I, what, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? Right. Um, they want me to write a book. Okay, I'll write a book. No big deal. They want me to do these reality TV shows. Okay, it's cool. We'll do that too. I said, but I really, my therapy is the music. That's why I'm able to, it's a purge for me. I'm, I'm able to express the internal rage that I have inside me. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to do it through a microphone than do it on someone's body. Yeah. Yeah. Who are your musical inspirations? I, I want to say that you do like Rage Against the Machine. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I got, I, when I was watching one of your videos, I got a total Zach de la Racha vibe from it. Yeah. Um, we were talking to uh, Tom Murrow a couple wow. weeks ago. Um, Best guitarist in the world. Yeah. We just, uh, actually, I just, uh, well, if you watch my TikToks, I just had, um, Angelo Moore, the founder and frontman of Fishbone here. Oh, really? Like, yeah, I mean, he's like, yo, he's walking around my house at six in the morning, fucking blasting the saxophone. And my wife came down and she was like, really? At six? At six. <laughs> but uh, inspiration hits at a crazy time. <laughs> hey, you hear something, um, you see something, it triggers a memory. Mm -hmm. It just, you never know what 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 it's gonna be. You know, I can I can see somebody. I can be at the grocery store with my fucking wife or my granddaughter. I'll see somebody and it's like that just triggered something in my mind of somebody that I remember from my past. So yeah, it's just I drive my family crazy because I pace around. I only sleep like about three hours, four hours a day, tops. Seven days a week I go twenty hours a day. Because I'm trying, I'm trying to make up for the almost 25 years I lost. Yeah. But I'm also like, all right, fuck, I got a short period of time left. A short period of time left to do what I think is my life's calling is to inspire, change, and pay it forward. My agent will probably scream at me, but I just, uh, I've had five heart attacks in the last two years. I just spent a month and a half in the hospital having a heart procedure. I just, I, I have to, I have to leave something. I have to, I have to change someone's life. I have to, but I have to do it for a positive reason. I need to leave my fingerprint on the world in a positive way and the only way I know how to do that is through just sheer will and determination just have to push forward that's what I do uh, again I don't know how my fucking family puts up with me you know my wife will she'll come down and I'm, I'm sitting down and I'm just, you know three in the morning she was like what the fuck or you gonna come to bed anytime this week I'm pacing back and forth. I can't sit still. I can't sit still. And then, you know, my psychiatrist was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to prescribe this to you. I'm going to prescribe that to you. And I'm like, what the fuck am I paying you for, dude? All the drugs I watched my mother ingest. And now you're trying to, you're trying to pop me full of pills. That's not, no. Screw yourself. I don't even like to take an aspirin. Yeah. Same. I, I, I was too traumatized watching what my mom did. The Valiums, the Percocets, the Oxycontins. I have this phobia, I guess now. You know, my, I have to argue with my wife. She's like, are you walking around, you know, your, your knee's gone. <laughs> my uh, orthopedic surgeon, you know, he, he came, you know, he came out to the house. And he was like, I can shoot you with cortisone right now. It's the best I can do. 
Best I can do. You need a knee replacement now. You blew it up. All right. Yeah. Cool. And then I said, okay. And I'm thinking to myself, I just obligated myself contractually into a deal with Roush Racing with NASCAR to headline a festival in April. It's like back on the phone. How long is my rehab going to be? And my dog is like six, seven months, total knee. I'm like, all right, we're going to have to push that back because I just gave someone my word that I would do this festival. And they put their reputation, their professional reputation on the line. So I have to do that. I don't care. It's self-sacrifice. It's not about the money. I don't care about the money. It's keeping your word. And at the same time, again, it's setting an example for our foster son, for my daughter. I mean what I say, and I say what I mean. If I tell you, you know, and it's it's the same thing back uh, back when I was in organized crime. I used to tell everybody, if I if I don't show up, when I tell you I'm going to be there, that means I'm either arrested or someone killed me. It's only that's the only way I'm going to miss that appointment. Morals and keeping your word. Keep your word, man. It's all you have. All you got. Yeah. All you have. I'll die with my word. And my nuts. That's it. Yeah. That's what I'll die with. And nobody can get me to, to break either one of them. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Sean, I could sit here asking you questions all day long, but we're going to have to wrap this up. And before we do, we always ask our guests to give a positive message to anybody that can relate to your story or maybe went through something similar, lived the same type of life. What would you say for them? on the other side here. Treat people the way you want to be treated, but pay something forward. I'm not saying give money to every homeless person on the sidewalk. Just treat people the way you want to be treated. Give that respect. Show compassion and empathy, but also don't 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 leave this planet. Whatever, whenever your time is, just don't 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 leave it broken. Do something positive. Do some make make an example. Make make it better for the future. Just make it better. Do something positive. Be empathetic. Be loving, be caring. Don't hurt people. Just don't do it, man. Sean, where can the viewers find you at? Uh, Facebook. Well, I suck at social media. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Facebook's just Sean Scott. Uh, Instagram is uh, Dirty Water Diaries. Um, TikTok is simple because I'm technically a retard. Um, mentally challenged. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Scott Hicks, simple, same as everything with me is, you know, it drives everybody around me nuts. <laughs> I'm just like, well, it's real simple for me and I can't forget. That's right. Just, yeah, Sean Scott Hicks on TikTok, Dirty Water Diaries. Uh, you can find us at uh, Diamond Cut Drums with Rotten Rollin', my business partner. We'll link it in the comments below in the description of this video. And we will also put a direct link so people can pre-order Sean's book. Sean Everywhere, Barnes and Nobles, you name it. It's in every major bookstore. It's being translated in, I think, 21 languages now. Nice. Wow, nice. <laughs> Sean, thank you so much for coming out tonight and uh, speaking with us. I hope you have yourself a great week, and I can't wait to see what comes next from you. PMA all day, baby. PMA all nice. day. All <laughs> <mental> attitude. <laughs> Thanks a lot, awesome. Sean. Broken Home Podcast, everybody. Have a great week.